Good morning to those watching in the United States. Good afternoon in Europe. I'm Ben Haddad and director of the Future Europe Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. It's my pleasure to introduce this conversation on European solidarity in the COVID-19 crisis, where our two guests, Italian Minister for European Affairs, Vicenzo Amendola, and Spanish State Secretary for the European Union, Juan Gonzalez Barbapera, two of the strongest voices for European solidarity in the last few months. This conversation will be held in partnership with our friends at NIAF, the National Italian American Foundation. And I'd also like to thank the dynamic teams at the Spanish and Italian embassy in their help for organizing this. The Atlantic Council is founded on the simple idea that the United States stands stronger with its allies, especially today in a time of common health, economic and geopolitical crisis, the transatlantic relationship is our best asset to prepare the world of tomorrow. We have been making that case that the resilience and unity of a strong EU is a key national interest of the United States. This is why the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council launched this year a major campaign, USEU at 70, 70 years after the Schuman Declaration to celebrate this EU-US relationship, but look forward to the common challenges that we're facing. These last months, the Atlantic Council has gone on offense to give a platform to global leaders to make the case for cooperation, not only to analyze the situation, but to shape the future together. In the last few weeks, for example, we've hosted Commission Vice President Skinas, Eurova, the foreign ministers of Sweden, Ladia, partnering with our uh, friends organizations all across Europe and many others. Italy and Spain have been at the forefront of this crisis. Both countries have been hard struck by the pandemic and both have been vocal and creative to support an ambitious European solidarity plan and, and make the case for global cooperation in response. Prime Minister Sanchez and Prime Minister Conte have both advocating for a massive European recovery fund in the form of grants to countries under pressure. And this led to the proposals this week being advanced by Commission President von der Leyen. We'll talk about this today. We'll also talk about the longer term challenges faced by Europe in the wake of the pandemic. Let me now turn to Atlantic Council non-resident senior fellow Alexis Crow, who will introduce our speakers and moderate this conversation with Minister Amendola and Minister Gonzalez Barbapera. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be able to uh, moderate this distinguished panel today. Um, at a moment, I think a, a positive turning point probably for European history that we've seen this last week in the wake of the crisis. Um, so we're joined by His Excellency Vincenzo Amendola, um, who serves as the Minister of European Affairs uh, for Italy um, and has had a long and distinguished career um, both within the Italian political community as well as on the global stage in foreign affairs and international affairs. We're also joined um, by His Excellency Juan González Barbapera, uh, who serves as the State Secretary for the EU uh, for Spain, and uh, who has also joined us from a long and distinguished career uh, and an active diplomatic life in foreign service. Prior to this current appointment, he served as the Ambassador to Turkey as well. Um, so, Minister, Secretary, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, I think, firstly, what we would love to be able to do is get your thoughts on this extraordinary commission package um, announced this week, a 750 billion euro package um, that we've seen. Many have called this a turning point to be able to catalyze and stimulate the recovery, um, particularly for the economy's hardest hit, both of which you represent in Spain and Italy. Um, so I would love to get your thoughts. Is this the golden bullet that we really needed to see? Um, and uh, Minister Amendola, I will turn to you first. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you very much. Uh, big greetings to the mio gran amico Juan. <laughs> that is, uh, we worked a lot. Indeed, Alex, you should know that in March, when we had the European Council and our Prime Minister Sanchez and the Prime Minister Conte were a bit very vibrant in the discussion <laughs> in that European Council, at that particular moment on the table, we had no fiscal policy tools. What we did from March till yesterday, I think is a good work. 
the European Union moved in terms of solidarity, but moved also in terms of vision. And this is the point. Indeed, the title from Ursula von der Leyen client is Next Generation EU. Because the European Union was always built up from crisis, as Jean Monnet said uh, many years ago. And crisis has to mobilize the reaction. Two months ago in March, we had not so many answers on the table. Today, what do we have? We have the European Central Bank that is boosting trillion in terms of uh, long-term uh, support on the market. We have the European Commission that lift up many rules that allow many countries like Italy, Spain, France to have a budget law that are more, uh, let's say, impressive in terms of uh, uh, helping the economy. And yesterday we got this plan of 1.8 uh, trillion compared uh, European uh, budget and the recovery fund that put all together not just a big amount, European Central Bank Commission and Council, but give also the sense that the European Union want to defend not just one state, want to defend the market union, want to defend the resilience of our economy and the value chain that will be under attack also because, as you, can, as you know, for our transatlantic relation, these days are very tough, not just for Europe, but for the United States and for other global players. So we need in the short term to go out from the, the crisis to have a recovery plan that will be dealt and channeled mainly on Green Deal and digital, but means investing on our in industrial base, investing on our value chain, invest investing also on the future of European Union that we must be more green, more digital, and more oriented to the uh, to the innovation that we are living on the on the labor market. So, what we did in this period is impressive. If I consider March nowadays on the on the table, we have European Central Bank three safety net that we approved one month ago for for unemployment, for business, and for health. Uh, let's say support of five hundred forty million. And now we have this new work that, of course, and I just conclude, we have to, to negotiate in the next week because we, have, we are going to have a difficult European Council in June where all these proposals should pass. But I think like Sanchez and Conte, President Macron, Councillor Merkel want to, want to say is that we are ready to do whatever it takes to defend European identity and also to plan a next generation for all our country. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, Secretary Consolis Barba Pera, your thoughts, please. Oh, I think you're on mute. Now it's okay? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Sorry. We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, hello to everyone, also to my good friend Enzo, and uh, he has nearly said it all. I would just uh, add a couple of things. First of all, uh, he was uh, telling and you in your introduction about vision, but I think it has to be stressed that it's also self-interest. We are about to, uh, to fight for the, uh, for the single market, for the euro and uh, for many other things that uh, go hand in hand with our European Union and this, um, after this crisis visited us all, there were, as we saw it, no other way out. We were, uh, Prime Minister Conte and Prime Minister Sanchez were advocating for a sort of Marshall plan, of, um, plan or if you wish, a Monet plan since the beginning, two months ago. And it's amazing what we've managed to do in these four weeks, uh, eight weeks. Also, I think it's very important that uh, the, uh, to remind everyone that the European Union is built upon the wish of uh, her citizens. And uh, we cannot lose the fight for uh, public opinion. And uh, I would say that in the case of Spain, we've always been European uh, enthusiasts. But uh, lately, since the uh, concatenation of crisis, the um, uh, the wider acceptance of the European Union was not, in my country, unanimous. We have some parties now, 
which are starting to be a little bit, I wouldn't say hostile to Europe, but uh, very much Eurosceptical. And it was important uh, for ourselves to receive such a boost in terms of uh, support and, uh, and the public opinion has reacted uh, accordingly. As, as uh, Enzo has said, we're still, we have still to negotiate the whole package and it will be an uphill task. Uh, so this is one point I wanted to stress, the fight for public opinion. And the second one is the importance of um, opinion makers, not policy makers. Uh, organizations such as yours, and first of all, and of paramount importance, of course, the European Parliament. The European Parliament had agreed uh, just before this package and, uh, a month and a half ago, two very important resolutions and a new unanim unanimity for groups the three main groups in the first one, the four main groups in the latest one, where it gave a clear signal to uh, the Council and Member States uh, about what was the only path to take. Uh, so the, there was no, no option here. And also I would say that since the beginning we could, we could feel that uh, the academic consensus was there with some exceptions. Even in the so-called frugal countries we could see the works of uh, uh, economists, uh, think tanks and all that, advocating for a strong uh, fiscal stimulus to get out of this uh, crisis. So these are the two points I want to, stray, to stress and uh, I give you back the floor. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. I think also uh, what's important is that when some of these economies, um, you know, have responded to the pandemic, um, there are open questions as to whether or not our, either countries have the fiscal space um, to be able to borrow and then to eventually pay off the debt and to recover, and then whether or not capital markets will respond positively um, to the unprecedented level of, of spending and borrowing that we've seen to be able to shore up economies amidst the health crisis and then to restore us on the path to recovery. I think one comforting fact was to note just the unprecedented demand um, for some of the bond issuance in the Eurozone that we've seen recently. Notably, I think Spain and in the bottom of the health crisis and pandemic um, had the highest number of orders for, Euro, for European bonds um, recorded, 97 billion euros of demand for a 15 billion euro issuance. 79% of that issuance being non-Spanish. So I think the capital markets are responding very positively to this. Another interesting point on, on how we pay for this debt going forward, uh, ECB chief economist Philip Lane mentioned earlier this week that you do have an, an also a surge in savings account with European households shocked, concerned about the future in the absence of a vaccine, um, that you do see a surge in savings. So. Uh, Philip Lane actually suggested that eventually that looks like a transfer rather than outright borrowing. Um, and that, of course, is predicated upon the assumption of an eventual, I think, capital markets union and banking union um, that we might see within um, the Eurozone. And I, I wanted to ask you both, you know, in terms of this package, some are saying, you know, whether or not this is an extraordinary response to a temporary circumstance and therefore the measures are temporary versus are these permanent changes? And then I'd like to offer something in the middle, which is potentially the response to never wait, let a good crisis go to waste. The response to the crisis is paving the way for more permanent changes uh, in terms of union. So I would love to get both of your thoughts on on are we, are we headed toward more a deepening of capital markets and fiscal union? I start. First of all, you are right. I mean, the, the impression that we have, of course, now there is, nowadays there is the issue of Hong Kong that is boiling a bit um, the market, but the, the, the reaction after the Ursula von der Leyen plan was fantastic. I mean, this time, if you compare with 10 years ago, this time, the whatever it takes, this famous whatever it takes from Mario Draghi was coming from the European political institution, not just from the European Central Bank that is doing a great job with Christine Lagarde. So this time with the reaction and the reaction was positive of the market is because they understand that 27 countries, of course, with differences, with different, let's say, narrative, but are uniting, standing together 
to defend the, uh, the European architecture, political and economical one. So this was a good uh, step forward for us. And secondly, for the first time, finally, we borrow on the market. There was a famous letter signed by Prime Minister Sanchez, President Macron, Prime Minister Conte from the 25th of March that we say it's time to do it. It's time to issue bond because it's not a question that we don't want to pay, but it's the question that we want to collect much more resources in order to invest, not in, in order just for solidarity. It's a question of investment that we have to do in order, of course, to react against the recession, but also to invest on industrial new basis and on the green, that is the main, uh, let's say, vision for the future. So our impression in terms of market economy, of course, all of us, 27 countries, we did a lot of uh, expenses. The, 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 the public debt in the Eurozone is increasing between 10 and 20 percent, but was necessary because the first reaction was to uh, during two months of lockdown was to take up the, uh, the, the, the public condition and also the social cohesion that is the most important thing. Now we can plan the recovery. So the starting point from yesterday is planning the recovery in the mid and long term. It means that we can, of course, always take care of the cohesion. The Commission uh, proposed and we already adopted this unemployment uh, a bond system that it's called sure of more than 100 billion that are distributed to to to, to have some unemployment benefit but now we have also the time schedule to plan in front of us in the next uh, few months what does it mean investing on the european union so uh, 10 years ago there was another price of course completely different but we saw what that what what it mean division in the european union I mean, many countries suffer and we spend even more money that were needed in order to, to, to protect the Eurozone and the European market. Nowadays, I think we are starting from the good point because there is a, 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 an issue that Juan was mentioning before. There is no frugal and free spending country. There are all countries that get benefits from the market union. <laughs> And if you look the number, even the frugal, they get more benefits from other countries, from the market union. So defending the market union is not an advantage for Italy and Spain, but is a big advantage for all 27. At this time, I'm, I was happy that a uh, leader like Macron, like Angela Merkel, were also on the front line. Uh, and this is a big difference from 10 years ago, where other two leaders, in one case was the same. <laughs> in the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis, they were not giving this input. Today, we have a different input and the market union, and the market union is more solid in terms of uh, working on the competitiveness for the future. And also, I understand that the, the, the number that we see every day on the stock exchange are quite well uh, in terms of recognizing this step forward. Of course, as I mentioned, this issue of Hong Kong, especially today, is a bit vibrant. Uh, and uh, between the two giants, United States and China, Europe is trying also to, to give, <laughs> to give uh, its particular message. At the moment, this is the task of the High Commissioner uh, Borrell, that is the leader of our foreign policy, that we know that is a a hot boiling issue that we have to face all together. I do want to come back to the China issue, but I will turn to Secretary Gonzalez Barbapera um, for his thoughts. Yes, uh, I would not, not to repeat what Enzo has said, I would uh, answering to your uh, first uh, remarks, I would say that uh, first of all, this is a one off crisis and, and it's very clear there will be a front loading of the vast. Uh, amount of the uh, of the funds that are going to be um, that are going to be raised on raised on the markets that's for sure uh, it, it won't it should not be a precedent but in a way we know that it will be in the sense that we if we ever face such a huge crisis like this one that affects symmetrically with asymmetric effects the whole of the European Union we know how we had reacted in the past and I'm sure we will uh, do uh, so again. In this case, there was no moral hazard implied. 
In fact, as far as Spain is concerned, we have been growing at uh, uh, about 3% consistently in the, in the last uh, four years, five years. So uh, no one can accuse us that we were not implementing reforms and all that. We were doing so. And we had, uh, we had been reducing unemployment heights that were reached uh, back in 2012, reached nearly 25% of the workforce here in Spain. So that, that's, that's one point. The second one is that, um, of course, the European Union hasn't got the agility of a, uh, of a of state, of a nation state to react quickly, quickly it takes time. But I have to say that since we have gone through the euro crisis, the financial crisis, we have the, the tools. We have already a European Central Bank, which uh, had used in the past uh, uh, massive uh, purchases of bonds on the secondary market, which was an issue at the time. In fact, just a, a week ago, there was a very uh, impacting um, decision by the um, German Constitutional Court regarding that, that first operation. So the European Central Bank knew how to react and did it uh, after a week uh, of the onset of the crisis. Then we had uh, a banking union in place. So uh, uh, we, we, it has to be completed. But of course, we didn't have uh, all along since the beginning of the crisis the, 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 the feeling or the fear that they might, the might, uh, we might have difficulties, unsurmountable difficulties for our banking system. That was also there in place. Also, there's another thing you were talking about uh, the banking system and the, the, the capital uh, um, going to capital market and all that. And I think Enzo has answered to that. But um, also another lesson learned from the previous crisis is that no one should be left behind. Uh, there were vast layers of our population which uh, have suffered a lot uh, in, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, I would say in southern countries, those most affected by the previous crisis. And uh, there was some work done by the previous commission because, in fact, in 2017 in Gothenburg, in the European Council and in Gothenburg, the commission, the uh, European Parliament and the Council agreed on what's called the social pillar, 20 points, uh, just to invest in our societies and not let anyone be left behind. In fact, in the proposal that commission tabled uh, two days ago, uh, there are several mentions, mentions to the uh, social pillars and in fact this is an issue that ourselves as a, a progressive government want really uh, to, to push. Um, not, 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 not forget that the European Union is not only about capitals, it's not only about markets, but it's also about social issues, about the European citizenship. So this is also an, a, an issue that I wanted to stress. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary. I do just want to prompt uh, on that note. Um, I think your government has come out with this minimum income guarantee, which is in many ways, I believe, an innovative structure in that it offers uh, relief to the poorest of the poor within Spain without being a universal basic income. I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's in fact, it was a historic uh, reivindication from progressive parties here, and it was in the coalition uh, government compact. And uh, even though in spite of the difficulties of the current moment, uh, the government believed that uh, it was precisely now at the toughest of times where this uh, measure should be approved and implemented as a matter of urgency. So this is what I can tell you uh, in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Um, and I do believe a lot of the dynamic labor market reforms that were done in Spain, I think, can be shared across the Eurozone, reducing underemployment um, I, and helping gig economy workers, I think have been very fantastic. Um, Minister Amendola, you mentioned China, and uh, I do want to turn to you, of course, is a very tricky question, one that um, slightly inhibits uh, pan-European cohesion at the best of times. Of course, we do not have a EU-China free trade agreement. 
now this um, extraordinary topic of Hong Kong rears its head at the moment when we're still reeling from the pandemic. Um, so how is how is the government, how, how are you all looking from Rome at the China question? Uh, uh, look, uh, as European, we had a problem. Um, indeed, uh, the German presidency was calling for a European Union China meeting in September. Now, before I mean, this was the schedule before the COVID-19, because European Union, I think, with China should be clear in terms of uh, not just free trade, but also in terms of global legal standards, in terms of respecting each other when you sit at the table. So uh, I thought, and I think still, that European Union should create this kind of uh, uh, table of discussion and negotiation with, uh, with China. The Belt and Road Initiative is not one way. <laughs> it should be a respectful relation in, also in terms of trade between the companies. If I just can open a, a, a bit spot, of course, me personally, I preferred that was a transatlantic issue. But anyway, we are going to discuss with China separately, and this is not the fault of the European Union, because I think it was better to discuss uh, together with our American allies all together. Uh, mm -hmm. What does it mean nowadays to have a free, fair uh, trade exchange with, uh, uh, with a giant like China? Concerning what we are discussing, uh, our High Commissioner Borrell is doing a great job. In the World Health Organization, uh, European Union was um, pushing for a resolution, uh, boosting this resolution for an independent inquiry about the COVID-19. My personal impression is that the World Health Organization was not impressive in how they managed this uh, crisis. So it's necessary to have an independent inquiry about uh, the roots of this COVID that destroyed, of course, all over the, the world, many people and uh, all our economy. And secondly, on the Hong Kong, we are going to speak as European all together. Uh, there are uh, treaty um, about Hong Kong and uh, respect of this treaty is is something that we have to ask, not just, of course, like always, we have to do it, the respect of the human rights and the free expression of the people all over the world, always. But also in terms of uh, uh, the rights of Hong Kong to, to see uh, the treaty respected. Uh, the system, the two system, one country is based of, a, of a, a, a something that was signed by China and should respect it. So I think as European, of course, we are united in giving all our voices in terms of Hong Kong issue. In terms of the future relation between European country and China, probably it's time that also as 27, that I want to mention, all 26, they have a, a trade loss in terms of trade exchange with China. So there is no huge benefit at the particular moment. If I see the number, just one country has it surplus with China. We need to restore a correct trade relation and also a respectful trade negotiation that we probably we never did. Thank you so much, Minister. Secretary Gonzalez Barbapera, your thoughts on, on EU-China and Spain-China? Uh, look, uh, also again, since I have the privilege of speaking after Enzo, he has said many things that I would have said. So, um, Two things. First of all, the European Union uh, recognized, acknowledged a year and a half ago that our relationship with, with uh, China is that of uh, a relationship with a country with, with which we are uh, partners, but also rivals, which is important. In the case of uh, America, we are allies, uh, and it's, mm. it's very important that we, we don't stand halfway. As Spain, we have a, a long-standing uh, friendship and military uh, alliance with America, also uh, in NATO, multilateral, but also bilateral, where we have uh, American bases here, military bases in Spain. So it, it's very clear where, where we stand between the two. Um, but um, in the case of America, we are uh, allies, but uh, sometimes we don't see things the same way. Um, and I since we are talking now, and I'm talking in my capacity of uh, EU Secretary of State, um, 
let's say that uh, the European Union is, I would say, the, clear, the, the, the clearest embodiment of what multilateralism means. And in fact, uh, it is only natural, it is in the EU uh, DNA to defend multilateralism and an international system based on rules uh, in any circumstance. So, for example, with simulated uh, a month ago, a uh, week ago, one contribution uh, with our views regarding the, the, the conference on the future of, of Europe, which will be launched in September, it has been adjourned because of the COVID-19. And there we suggested that part of that reflection should be uh, enlarging the external side of it, so that it's very clear that when the European Union thinks about its future, it thinks about multilateralism, and in fact, it should associate to the to uh, debates the closest allies regarding some issues that have been altered because of the COVID, be it mobility and tourism, be it uh, technology, uh, be it the health governance, uh, or be it the uh, the change, the global cha value chains, for example. So uh, this is how we see it. And, uh, and, and I, would, I would like and I hope that out of this crisis, the, uh, the European Union will emerge with a clear European voice on the international scene. That uh, it will be really a, a very uh, a front runner of a multilateral uh, solution on whatever or for whatever issue you might think out, whether trade, uh, health governance, you name it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary. I just want to remind the audience that you can send a question via um, the Q&A function in Zoom and happy to be able to field these um, to our distinguished panel. Um, I do just want to, to dovetail off of this and think about the 5G. Um, President von der Leyen pre presented some very strong views on, on obviously the priorities of green and digital but I, I would like to turn to each of our panelists to ask, do you see any structural impediments to being able to truly catalyze 5G within the European Union indigenously? I noted that the single largest export category from China to the EU 28 is telecoms equipment. It's telecoms equipment by a long, long mile in terms of trading goods. Um, so um, Minister Amendola, I'll turn to you first. You know, do we think that these plans are idealistic or feasible? Uh, look, in terms of screening, uh, Europe is doing a great job because we are starting to work also on our sovereignty in terms of technological um, capacity. And so we, we are developing a common screening of what does it mean for an investment, especially when the investments are directed to the security asset of each country. And also nationally, we are improving uh, new legislation. Um, Italy, I think Spain before us, and also France, we did these golden power uh, measures in order to protect our uh, interest, especially the security one, because technology is the second revolution that we are living since 20 years, but means also entering in the new fuel competition that is uh, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the data, um, uh, let's say, ownership, and the data ownership in many countries means security. So how we are looking also at the uh, 5G issue is not just how to impressive manage the technological revolution, but also how to defend the security asset. And in this reason, we developed all of us some new legislation to protect our um, communication system, our we protect the, the data that are following uh, all the European markets. So uh, there could be, I mean, our point with this uh, new budget is to improve a common technological, uh, let's say, asset. Uh, in terms of 5G, we know that uh, we, which are the competitor at the moment. And uh, unfortunately, there is one that is more competitive than the other. I hope that we can uh, rebuild this balance with uh, also some important European company that are working on the 5G. But for us, technology and uh, digital revolution is the for sure the future of the European Union. We are boosting more money for research, common research. 
But at the same moment, in the short term, means also security asset. Indeed, all of us they are obliged to screen up what this uh, mean, this foreign investment towards our country. Thank you so much, Minister. Secretary Gonzalez Barbapera um, on 5G and, and the indigenous growth. Well, uh, you know that there is a lot of talk now in Europe about uh, strategic autonomy, and everyone is conscious that cannot there cannot be strategic autonomy without digital autonomy. So we're very much bent, as Enzo Minister Amendola has said, uh, on just developing uh, uh, European capacities that could be at the forefront in terms of uh, technical excellence. Uh, but in the meantime, we just cannot lag behind. And I think we will uh, just opt for the option which is more advanced as long as we can uh, secure or guarantee uh, the safety and the security of its uh, employment. And uh, well, the two uh, diverging views here. Uh, one says that once you use that technology, you are in a way uh, given, giving away basic uh, basic elements of your uh, domestic security or EU security. And there are others who uh, defend that, no, you can use it and at the same time protect uh, the, uh, the security of the, of the, of the user. No? So uh, in the meantime, I think that uh, there's, there, is, uh, there, there isn't a clear cut uh, answer to your question. Um, as far as Spain is concerned, we are just uh, uh, trying to see how to combine uh, uh, top most advanced technology with the necessary security. Uh, so this is what I can tell you. Thank you so much. I have a, I'm afraid I have a tricky question for both of you um, from the audience. Do you think that the position of the Frugal Four um, is to block the Macron-Merkel initiative or to merely influence how it emerges? Uh, Minister Amendola, I'll turn to you first. I can answer with uh, another joke. I hope that they are going to stop the, the Macron-Merkel proposal because now we have one that is even better. So <laughs> <laughs> if they concentrate on the last one, now we have one better. No, I don't think so. I mean, with Juan, we work a lot, speaking also with our friends from the frugal country. Of course, we have some differences in terms of public opinion because spending money, borrowing on the market, there are concepts that we are uh, developing for the first time. So this could create some differences. But at the end of the day, what we are trying with Quan to underline everything, the interest of the public opinion and the economical base and the industry and the labor market of the four frugal country are related to the European market integrity. So the benefits are coming from there. Uh, I make an example. Uh, Netherlands has 65% of export related to the European Union. And if the European Union market collapse, there is no benefit, not for just for Italy and Spain, but for all the 27. And this was the, the impressive also move that the German leadership did in the last, uh, in the last months, understanding that the reality of our industrial base, of our value chain are related to the market union. In the short term, of course, export all over the world cannot be uh, the first answer. Europe, uh, the 30% 30, 30 of GDP is based on export, but we know that in the short term, all the global communities under recession, so cannot be the first answer. The first answer is to work on the resilience of the market union. And the benefits from the market unions go uh, I, I would say a lot to the frugal country. So at the end of the day, we are trying to negotiate, to be patient, to be respecting, of course, all the different public opinion. But together with solidarity, as Juan mentioned at the beginning, we have a common interest. And probably these four countries, they have a, a bigger common interest <laughs> to, to, to work for the, uh, the common market integrity. Thank you so much, Minister. Secretary Gonzalez-Barba. Yes, on my part, I would add, first of all, just as I said before, that it's in the EU DNA uh, to have a multilateral approach on the international scene. 
the DNA when we deal internally is just an ongoing process of negotiation. I frankly uh, think and, and I'm, I'm confident that there will be no vetoes. Of course, they will try to uh, uh, negotiate things that would uh, cater for more for, for, for the tastes. But, uh, but in the end, I'm confident that we will manage to reach a compromise in which everyone will be not 100% satisfied, but uh, not 100% unsatisfied either. That's one point. Mm. Second point is that uh, it, it's, it's tricky to be dealing in politics uh, in Europe because uh, national governments respond to, the, uh, to their electorates and to their public opinions. But at the same time, when we are here and, and when we, uh, and so myself and all the other 25 colleagues, when we present initiatives, we also try to think on European terms. And there is also a European electorate. There is an European public opinion, uh, which is embodied first and, and foremost in the European Parliament. But it's not so obvious uh, when you're a national politician and you have to go through elections, through your national elections, how you combine both. I would say that in the case of, of Germany, it's easier. It's the biggest country in terms of populations, in terms of GDP, in terms of geographical centrality. So German leaders uh, tend to see with greater ease than others where the national interests and European interests lie and to what extent they are intertwined. And I'm sure that uh, with the four countries you mentioned now, we are going to enter into a process where for them also the European interest will be paramount when taking decisions. I'm confident about that. And, and the third point I would like to, uh, to make regarding this issue is the need to combat uh, stereotypes. Uh, they always exist and they, they exist nationally and I'm sure that also in America you have a stereotype for uh, people from the Eastern course and the Western course and those who live in Florida and the, uh, you know, you have a, a, a time, a type of, uh, of, of uh, idea of, of how they are, no? And it happens in Europe. And, and we should strive, all of us, to uh, let stereotypes have, uh, don't, don't, don't have the, param the, the, the determinant position there. Uh, it's true that you will not going to uh, to uh, to do away with them, but uh, it's important that when you are negotiating such uh, complex issues, that you try to see things objectively, to analyze them objectively, to see where your interests, national and European interests, uh, lie, and and really as a political leader. Uh, just forget about uh, stereotypes. Uh, that's important in order to conclude uh, that is a satisfactory deal, I would say. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful note to end on. And um, on behalf of the Atlantic Council, I would just like to thank you both for your extraordinary service. And I think that, uh, you know, in part for what you do for the European Union, but also the public diplomacy with which you engage within your own local populations to be able to uphold and support uh, these values for, for which we all stand. Um, so, Minister Secretary, thank you so much, and uh, we wish you all the best and look forward to seeing you on the other side. Thank you, Alexis. Bye-bye, Enzo. Bye-bye, all of you. Thank you.